In this interview, I talked to Mike Rasika, founder of YoungArchitect.com. The super cool part is Mike and I have crossed paths in the past. In fact, early on when I started Niche Site Project, the blog, Mike bought one of my early products, the book on Amazon affiliate marketing. So Mike's story is really cool. He is an architect and he struggled to pass the different exams that an architect needs to take to go pro. And he documented his journey and took this blog, Young Architect, from a side hustle into his full-time gig. So his story is pretty amazing and you know, he struggled to get through writing classes in high school and he tells us his story of that. And now he's an educator and, you know, writes all the time. So it's a really inspiring story and Mike is helping tons of people. Do check out his site, Young Architect, even if you're not an architect, just to see like the value that he's providing. And without further ado, let's go ahead and get to the interview. Hey, what's up? Doug Huntington here from Niche Site Project, and I'm sitting with Mike from Young Architect. How are you doing today? Awesome. I'm excited to chat with you today, Doug. So a lot of people probably don't know who you are, Mike. So can you give us a little bit of an intro, who you are and what you do? Yeah. So my name is Michael Rasika. I live, I used to live in Portland, Oregon, but I, about a year ago, I moved back to a New York City area. I'm a licensed architect and all my stuff really started, kind of the story begins with me blogging. I had a really long, convoluted, crazy journey towards becoming a licensed architect from getting through architecture school, through get, getting through my internship hours, through taking my architect exams. And by the time I became a licensed architect, I had realized that the profession of architecture is essentially F and it needs a lot of help in this process of becoming a licensed architect. No one was helping create more licensed architects. If anything, there were just so many barriers and so much bad information in the way. And so by the time I had my license in hand, I said, you know what? I had some previous, I had some previous history for starting blogs in the past, mostly travel blog. Uh, I said, let me start a little blog about architecture. And I started blogging at youngarchitect.com and it kind of just became a little passion project. And I started talking about, you know, what I learned in architecture school, how I studied for my exams, the resources, the tools that I use. And very quickly, I just had a, a really, a really positive response from my community. And I started to tell the story of how I, you know, it took me three and a half years, it took me four and a half years to pass the architect exam. I failed four times. I almost didn't finish at one point, but I figured it out and this is how I figured it out. And it was really the first time I realized, it took me about a year after I told that story to realize that no one had really told that story before to the community. And everything before that was these exams are easy and everyone's getting it done. And for me to come along and say, you know, I did fantastic in architecture school. I had a great career. And this, this thing is not as straightforward as I originally thought it was. So that just resonated with my community. And I kept telling that story. And what started to happen was I, I grew youngarchitect.com. And uh, eventually I said, let me write a book. How about I write a book and I share everything I know about the architect exam and I put out this little black book called How to Pass the Architect Registration Exam. And people really enjoyed it. They really liked it a lot. What started to happen from there was people started reaching out to me and saying, Mike, I want to hire you. I want to hire you to help me figure out how to get past my exams. I, I don't care what it costs. My office will pay for it. And I want you to coach me. And I thought about it for a while and I said, no, I don't want to do that. Because the problem with the architect exam is everything about the architect's education and how we practice architecture, it's always a collaboration. There's always a lot of people, it's, you're never alone. There's always, we're working together through challenges and projects, except when we get to the architect exam, suddenly everyone's on an island and it's a self-guided process with no real deadlines. And so I said, no, I don't want to work individually with people. It would just kind of feed into the problem. And then eventually, uh, as more people kept asking, I said, you know what? Let's treat it the same way we went through architecture school. And so I said, let's, it's like a design studio. Gotcha. You guys, I'll create the syllabus, the schedule, the program, and you guys go study. And then let's come back together once a week and see what we can learn from everyone else's experiences. Because when I was in design school, I, I actually learned way more from the people I went to school with than the people than the professors themselves. Yeah, so I created this group coaching program that really kind of started from the blog, which grew from the book, which kind of created its own element. And from there, I ended up, I've been running that program now for three years. I've taken about 400 people through that group coaching program, and it's been really successful. And then awesome. kind of the next, the next level for that, which is what I've been working on really hard on lately, is creating like a video course program 
was, you know, my ARE bootcamp program, it's, it's not, I always say it's, it's a program. It's not a class. It's not a course. I'm not going to teach the content to you. I'm going to coach you through how to do this and teach you how to teach it to yourself. But I've also now started teaching the content with uh, one of the guys from my program who's just a, he's a, a brilliant professor and he's just really good at explaining this stuff. And so him and I have teamed up. We've been teaching content now on a, on a video platform. I call it the Young Architect Academy, where it's like an online video. I used to think if it kind of hosts okay. all that. It sounds like, so you've been at it for about three years on Young Architect, is that right? Yeah, I started the blog in January of 2014, so I'm approaching five years now as a a blogger. Okay, and in the beginning, let's go back like in that 2014 period, that first year, did you get traction like right away? It sounded like people resonated with your story, but I know a lot of times in the first year, we're trying to figure out what to yeah. do. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I knew, see, part of my challenge was I was studying my butt off working on my exams and getting licensed and there's nothing creative whatsoever about the passing these tests. Um, I always say the only thing that you're creative about, you can be creative with is how you study because it's all about following rules, you know, giving the right answer, not taking risks and being safe. And how we're trained as architects is the completely separate mindset. And so in some ways, everything that brought me success as in architecture school was my handicap on these exams. And so as I was getting closer to my exams, I felt like there was a big part of me that had been suppressed for years, was I wasn't making art, I wasn't expressing myself, I wasn't putting things out there. And so as soon as these, I didn't have to study anymore, I said, I'm gonna blog, I'm gonna just rant and rave. And I was already good at, I've already had a little experience doing that. And so as soon as the blog, actually it was shortly before I wrapped up my exams, I started blogging under my own name to just kind of get my feet wet, you know, start to learn, am I using Squarespace, am I using WordPress, you know, kind of figure things out like that. And I was just blogging under my name without really a direction just to kind of figure it out. And then once my exams were done, I got clarity about this idea that I'm going to start a blog for the future of the architecture profession. And I ended up just using all that content I was kind of writing and just moving it over to my own domain. And from there, just start ranting and raving. But, you know, one of the things I had learned very early on is that, I don't remember who taught it to me, but it's that to have a successful blog, it's really 20% writing and creating content and 80% of holding people's hands and bringing them to your site and say, hey, look, listen, I wrote this article for you. Here's a link. Click the link and go read it. And so very early on, I was dr- pretty much driving and tapping into all the resources where people were hanging out who needed this information. I had made that connection very early on that if you're going to create content for certain people, you have to deliver it to them and bring it to them and drive the traffic back to your site. And so, yeah, that so I was getting traffic pretty early on. And then before I even started this blog project, I said, if I'm going to pour my heart and soul and all of this energy into a blog, it has to make money. And so back then I, I was using Amazon, the Amazon Associates program to talk about books that I studied. And so I remember it was January of 2014, right when I first started studying, I ended up making like two or 300 bucks my first month of on this brand new blog through wow. Amazon affiliates. You know, I didn't realize it at the time, but January is a very popular time for this type of topic. So people were were, were devouring this content and clicking my links and buying these books. And wow. then after that, it dries up. So I okay. made a lot of money the first couple of months. And then it was like, it went dropped down to like 20 or 30 bucks a month. And I was like, oh my God, what did I do wrong? This and that. <laughs> so it sounds like you knew early on that you needed to do some marketing, right? Let people know about the site. And you you mentioned you had travel blogs in the past, right? Or you had some experience blogging. Can you just tell us a little about those? Yeah, first off, I barely graduated high school because I couldn't pass a standardized test in writing. I was just, I just couldn't pass it. I was a special ed student with writing, reading and writing. And I just, I did awful in school pretty much my whole life until I got to architecture school. I've always been in love with computers and I've always, in high school, I was on live journal writing about everything in the world, but I couldn't pass the standardized test without writing a silly essay about something. When I was in college, I got into cycling and I ended up doing a a bicycle ride from Boston to New York City. And while I was researching that ride, I learned about these people who were cycling across America 
and they were journaling about it. The word blog didn't even exist back then. It was like 2000, 2002 or 2003. And so I became addicted to reading about these blogs about people who are cycling across America. And I was like, I have to do this. I have to have to do this. And I obsessed about it for years. And then in 2005, I rode from Virginia all the way out to the coast of Oregon. And I actually blogged the whole thing. And I wrote about all the people I met along the way, all the experiences. At the time when I was starting that trip, when I was planning it, everyone told me, you were nuts. You are not gonna be able to accomplish this. I'm not going to drive to Colorado to pick you up when your bike falls apart. Like everyone told me like, don't do this. This is stupid. But I did it anyway. And I blogged about it. And it was an amazing experience. And then I did that in 2005. In 2007, I wrote, I rode, I was getting ready to graduate architecture school. My best friend said, Hey, you want to ride cross country again? So I said, sure. So we did a second trip from Bar Harbor, Maine to Portland, Oregon. And I blogged that trip as well. And I ended up staying in Portland for 10 years. That was a one way trip. And then 2016, after I quit my job, I ended up writing a third cross country cycling blog as well. So yeah, I've been writing about bikes and architecture. That's uh, it's amazing how much writing that you've done and you know, you couldn't pass the standardized test, which yeah. is not a very effective test. A lot of people <laughs> would argue anyway. So, and, and ironically, Doug, I don't actually identify myself as a writer or really even a blogger per se, because I've learned, I don't know, just through all this stuff, I've learned there's a huge community of people who walk around calling themselves writers and they don't actually write anything. And right. they, don't, they don't, they never write the book they wanted to write. They don't write the blog. And they, they're, if you ask them what they do, they'll tell you they're a writer. And at the end of the day, I'm really an architect who writing is just one of my many skills that I like mm -hmm. to do. So. And you're like educating. I mean, now it's an easy leap since you literally have stuff where you're helping people study and you're an educator yeah. and a teacher. So awesome. At this point, I did a little research. So you're doing youngarchitect.com full-time at this point, right? You're not practicing yeah. at a firm I, or anything I like that. I don't have time for that, yeah. I don't have time for some, some old lady's remodel project anymore. Um, <laughs> I've passed that work off to other people. But yeah, this cool. Young Architect thing is, and you know, in a weird way, it's, I always say it's probably the most important project. I've been more fulfilled by being my own boss and working on this Young Architect stuff and helping my community and helping. I always say, you know, my job, my role in all this isn't to look cool. It's to kind of work behind the scenes and help other people be successful to support the, the right. profession. Now, when you went full time and you, you left your firm, because I take it you left some full time gig, right? What, yeah. was, what were some of the big challenges working for someone else and I imagine kind of a structured environment to anything goes, you're your own boss? Yeah. That was really hard for me. It was really, really hard. I had also started another business. It was the same time I started Young Architect. I was listening to a podcast and I forgot who it was, but I was listening to a podcast and someone was talking about the Amazon fulfillment by Amazon program. I don't know if you're not familiar with it, but it's essentially the Amazon Prime program where people are going into stores and they're seeing what's on sale and they're buying products at 70% off and they're selling on Amazon for four or five times the price. And I said, I've also always been good with eBay and Craigslist and selling things. So I said, you know what, let me try it. And so I ended up starting an Amazon, a fulfillment by Amazon business at the same time I started the blog. I ended up making a lot of money at it. I got really good at it. And so I was uh, working this Amazon business and I didn't care what I was buying, what, I w what it was. I was buying Barbie dolls and toys and and just weird stuff. And as long as I can make a profit. So I started that business and in a weird way, you know, I've never heard any entrepreneur talk about this, but it kind of became a cash cow for me to finance my young architect project. Young architect didn't make any money. It cost, a, it actually, I, I, one of my big mistakes was I, I spent so much money trying to figure out how to do this and hiring, you know, people that I didn't really need and buying books that weren't really that helpful. And I don't know. It was the, the cash cow to help me get some capital to finance a young architect and to just put extra money in my bank and help me get some money saved. So I started that without even realizing what I was doing. And then it was about a year and a half down the road. I used to work for um, the city of Portland, Oregon. I was a, a facilities project manager. I, my role was to get construction projects done for the city. So I played the role of the owner and I would hire architects, contractors, engineers and play the middleman. I mostly worked for the cops, to be honest with you. It was mm -hmm. I was the middleman between the police officers who needed their, their precinct renovated with, you know, the design team that would make that happen. And as things were, you know, I, I was doing really good in my job. It was a great job, but I essentially hit the ceiling and I just couldn't grow anymore. And Young Architect was taking off. Um, I was starting to struggle a little bit with showing up at work every day. I was kind of seeing, starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And then I, I wrote my book. The book was out. 
And I felt like for a very long time, I was working 40 hours a week for the man. And then I was working 40, 50 hours a week on my passion projects in this silly Amazon business. And so eventually everything kind of came to a halt. And I said, I just can't do this anymore. There's just been too much. My young architect at that time was cre was bringing in probably about half of my day job income and the Amazon business was fulfilling the rest of it. I was essentially almost collecting two pay paychecks at that time. And then I just, it, it was really, it was a lot of baggage for me to, to just kind of quit the job. I felt like, I, I, I say it all the time, it felt like I was breaking up with a girlfriend who I knew for a very long time. It was just, one, it just wasn't working out, but I let it go longer than it should have. And now I just got to cut the cord and do the right thing. And that was kind of what it was for me. Gotcha. That's a great analogy. I haven't heard that before, but <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> so how long were you, I guess, how long did it take before you, you quit your full-time job? I started Young Architect in January 2014, and by September of 2015, I was ready to step away from the day okay. job. Yeah. All right. Gotcha. So about eight, 18, 19, 20 months, something like that? Yeah. A year and a half. Okay. That's cool. That's cool. And I think, I mean, that's what I recommend to people uh, generally if they're like, hey, should I quit my job or should I try and double dip and figure out how to make this work? I mean, do you, I mean, you obviously did that, but if, if someone asked advice from you, yeah. are you like, make the leap and you'll figure out how to, you know, get the parachute to come out uh, on the way down or uh, are you risk averse? <laughs> no, I, I say, um, you know, I feel like if I didn't make that leap, I w it was holding me back from growing to the next to the next thing. And so as soon as I let go of that day job, a million other opportunities opened up in other things for me. One of them was, you know, cycling across the country again. I wanted to right. I had done those trips a long time ago and I'd been so busy being an adult and an architect and building my career. I, I let that that was that used to be a big part of who I am and I had just gotten very far away from it. And so I said, you know what? I'm gonna take this cross country trip. And I actually started planning the cross-country trip before my, my 2016 trip, before I had quit the job. And actually, one of the pivotal conversations was one of my best friends said to me, I was telling him, I was like, dude, I'm going to ride cross-country the summer 2016 and blah, blah, blah. He was like, but what about your job? And I was like, well, I'll have to bank up some vacation time or we'll have to figure it out. I'll take a sabbatical. And I was coming up with all these excuses. And after I said all that, I said, you know what? I, I got to stop making excuses for this job. This job isn't isn't running my life. If the job isn't going to let me, I'm, I'll quit my job. I'll get a new one. I'll get a new job if I have to. But this, I can't be making excuses like this. I got I have to go do this thing. So. And uh, just a quick note on the the retail arbitrage via FBA. I, I take it you're not doing that anymore since Young Architects blow yeah, up. Yeah, I had to let it so. go. Okay. Yeah. And was I had that to let hard it go. to, yeah. it was bringing in good, good money bringing in good money and i always say it was it was a job though i know a lot of people are very passionate about it there's a whole community and people are really proud of, of the businesses they built doing this but to be honest with you it was just a job to me physically i was working on this amazon retail arbitrage business but mentally i just i didn't it was it was a lot of manual it was a lot of physical labor i used to walk through target every day on my way home from work and when i wasn't commuting to the office anymore i now had to go out of my way my goal was to always make it as efficient as possible. And it was just something I did behind the scenes while I was mentally brainstorming and thinking about Young Architect. It was as good as I am at it. I, I ended it um, at the end of, when did I end it? At the end of, at the end, like in the middle of 2016, I was like, I can't do this anymore. Now it's, it's a pain in the butt job. And so I just let everything I had sitting in their warehouses liquidate. And that was probably one of my big mistakes too. I probably should have kept that cash cow rolling just a little bit, a little bit longer. One of the big mistakes I also made too with you know quitting the day job was I quit the day job and I had a lot of momentum and I had a lot of enthusiasm, but I racked up a bunch of debt. I racked up debt with a cross country bike ride with, I hired a bunch of people to help me do things and I think I probably hired them maybe a little bit prematurely. I wasn't quite ready to, to be taking on these larger projects. I think I scaled up a little bit too fast, but at the end of the day, I racked up about 20 grand in credit card debt with the, you know, with the intention of, you know, this young architect thing's gonna just, 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 it'll take care of it. And so, you know, one of my big advice for everyone is to be super, super diligent. If you're gonna make this leap, be really, really careful with the debt because I didn't know it at the time, you know, my income goes up and down to plan accordingly for that. 
I just and and to be honest, Doug, it took me a really long time to to get rid of that debt. Even after you know everything, I was in the green with all of her stuff. I was still chipping away at that debt for a very long time. And it was one of my one of my biggest mistakes in all this. Very, very good to know. And, and I think um, it's hard for people to budget when they don't know, like potentially the ROI in the future. Do you have any tips, Mike, on like how someone can make some assumptions, come up with a budget so that they don't end up in a in a hole, right? Yeah, I'm terrible with money. And knowing that, I ended up back a couple of years ago, right when I was starting, when I was kind of in the middle of digging myself into this hole with my credit card debt, I reached out to one of my business coaches and said, listen, I, this is going to, this is going to kill me. And I don't know what's going, I don't know if I'm making, if I'm ahead or if I'm in the green or I'm in the red and where I'm at and how much debt I have. And I ended up hiring a bookkeeper and kind of a, she's kind of a fancy bookkeeper. She, she manages all of my, what's coming in, what's going out. At that time I had a lot more transactions because of the Amazon business. She made sense of where I'm at financially. And she also does forecasting and budgeting and helping me get a sense of where I'm I'm at financially. So I let her handle all of that and she updates me and we work on it together. But there's no way I could have ever made sense of any of this financial stuff. So my advice would be to hire someone that's good at that to help help anyone. So I mean for me it was I had to hire someone so I could make the art and make the money. And I think, you know, for my I'll add my two cents into, but you know, one thing I'm going to underscore for people that don't understand the business model that you had, especially with the Amazon FBA, like you're buying, you're holding inventory for an amount of time and you don't know like when it'll sell or exactly, I mean, I guess when you set the prices, you kind of have an idea about what it's going to sell for. But at the end of the day, like there's some flexibility, like you said, you had to liquidate and you were like, you know what, let's just clear the warehouse, let's get rid of it so you don't have to pay for any of those fees. But anyway, it's complicated. It gets complicated fast. And then from my perspective, I do a lot of content for Amazon affiliate sites. Mm -hmm. So in that case, it's kind of unclear when the ROI will kick in. And then once it does, it, it does yeah. really well, but it may not. So it's kind of sketchy. And I think, you know, like you said, if you have a, you know, a bookkeeper or at least someone with more experience, depending on what you're doing to help you forecast, make some assumptions, at least you won't go too far under. And if you're, you know, bookkeeper probably is working with you once a month, I suspect. So you're never further than like one month of like, you know, in the red, and then hopefully you can correct uh, yeah. the next month or something. So interesting. Well, that that's a great, uh, you know, mistake that people can learn from you on. Uh, that's a great one. Yeah. All right. It sounds like you have like deep internal motivation, especially for young architect and the journey that you went through. Are there times when like your motivation wavers or when you thought about like giving up, like, Hey, this isn't working. I'm in 20, 20 K deep of, yeah. uh, debt here. So uh, how Absolutely. do you stay motivated? I was talking about this last night with one of my friends was I'm as weird as it is, as I'm not money driven. It's money in, in, in a weird way. A lot of people just want to make a lot of money and that's the goal. For me, that that is the goal and I want to pay my bills and I want to live comfortably. But after that, what do I really want to accomplish? And one of the things that is probably just as important or sometimes even more important is, is I really like the recognition and I really like to be acknowledged for what I've contributed and what I've accomplished. And one of the things that I've really received in, in a very profound way was just people reaching out to me saying, Mike, I've been following you for three years and I just passed my last exam and I couldn't have navigated this world if you didn't exist. Thank you. And to have those messages and to have that constant reaffirm, like constantly being affirmed, reaffirmed or acknowledged for this, this body of work that I've been creating and what my, I mean, ultimately my mission is to help the next generation of architects be more successful than any other generation. That's the goal. Because what I was seeing getting to the point, you know, the people, no one was helping anyone do that as weird as it is to say. So to have that acknowledgement is really in a big way, kind of what's been the fuel on my fire and to keep going and to just kind of, I, I embark on all these projects. You know, I write a lot of blog posts. I've had a, I had a talk with my business coach about it. I spend all this time and energy writing all this blog content and it's not monetized. And at, at a certain point, like that's good, but I got to chill out a little bit and make some money for the business. But, but yeah, I really, you know, having that acknowledgement and being of service has been super important to me. Very cool. 
You mentioned a business coach. So it sounds like you, you do invest in that. Are you part of like mastermind groups as well, pr either private yeah. or paid or anything like that? What's your experience yeah. with I've done a bunch. I actually started with, uh, it was Nick Loper did a mastermind group many years ago and I jumped right on it. And I actually stayed in his mastermind group for quite a while and working with other people who are just getting started up. As I've gone down the road and, and had more experience, I've backed away from the mastermind situation because I feel like, I don't know, it's just a group dynamic. Sometimes I vibe really well with the people in the group and sometimes it's just not there. And I don't want to share, I don't know, it's just, it's just uncomfortable. Sure. So, but I've always, you know, I've, I found a really good business coach who was kind of already in my circle, who was very familiar with my goals and what I was trying to accomplish. And I started working with him for a long time. Uh, I ended up doing another kind of a group coaching program. And then I have another woman now who I work with. But coaching for me has been, one of the best investments for me to make sense of this all. In my early, kind of in the early years of, of, these pro, of the Young Architect, what I needed in some ways more than anything was to have someone on my team saying, yes, Mike, you can do this. I believe in you. Your community is going to love it. This is going to work out. It's all going to work out. Keep, keep going. You're doing a great job. And to ha I didn't have that. I don't, I don't, I don't get that from my community from my friends who are all practicing architects, they, they don't understand internet business or blogging or social media or any of that stuff. They're making buildings. Mm -hmm. And so to have someone kind of just really supportive and really encouraging at the beginning was super, super profound for me. And when I quit my day job, I actually never even told my parents. I didn't tell my parents because I didn't, I didn't want anyone that wasn't in my, behind me saying, you know, what are you doing? Why, why are you leaving your comfortable government day job with excellent retirement benefits to and embark this entrepreneurial thing? It's not going to work out. What are you, nuts? Uh, so I never told them. I never told them. And they didn't find out for like six or nine months until after I quit the job. But I think that a big, early on, having someone to just stand behind you and say, yes, you can do it. That was just profound for me. And, it, and coaching's always paid for itself. And I have a coach now and kind of what, how I work with her now is she's, um, she's really good at branding, marketing, messaging, and public speaking. And I'm, that's essentially what I'm doing now is I'm, I've been traveling around the country, giving lectures about the architect exam and entrepreneurship in the architecture community, writing, writing good letters, good, what's the messaging of this blog post I'm trying to write, a lot of copywriting. And so she's kind of helps me she kind of coaches me through a lot of that stuff. Very now, cool. Yeah. And, and you just touched on, uh, you know, the speaking tour that you want to, can you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So a couple of years ago, and actually when I, a couple of years ago, when I met my current business coach, she told me what she does. And I said, oh, I'd love to public speak. I'm just not quite ready for that yet. And I wasn't, I wasn't ready for it. And then as time went on, I started to realize meeting my community and seeing them face to face and talking about what I've been working on in Young Architect and how to pass the exams has, is really powerful. It's powerful for them and it's powerful for me. And I ended up doing more public speaking. I ended up reaching out to this conference in Puerto Rico reached out to me. They're like, Mike, we want you to come give your lecture about the architect exam. And I said, yeah, I'll do it. I got this other idea. I want to make this other lecture about entrepreneurship. Here's my idea. And they're like, yes, we want it. And so I was like, oh, now I'm on the hook. I've got to create this entrepreneurship lecture. But I ended up, uh, within the past two or three years, I've just been going after every single speaking opportunity to talk with people studying for their exams, to talk to other architects, to meet with students and give them information. Speaking doesn't bring in, it's not a huge source of income for me. I get paid, I don't know, 100, 200 bucks. A lot of times I just do these things for free. What it does is it gets my message out there. It brings people back to my site. People sign up for my program, they buy my products because I've met with them. And then um, I'm not a fan of cold weather. I just, I'm sick of doing the winter times. I just, I'm a wimp in the cold. I always have been. And so I was, I'm in New York and suddenly it's the middle of winter. I said, you know what? I want to go down to Florida and visit my mom. And if I'm going to go down to Florida, why don't I stop at a couple of places and give a couple of lectures? And so I laid out this map. I run my ARI boot camp on Sunday, Monday nights. So there's only a couple nights that are in the week. And I ended up laying out this map and the whole thing just grew out of control. And I ended up creating this whole tour speaking tour. And I drove from New York down to Miami over to New Orleans, up to Indianapolis, and back to New York. And I spoke in like 20, 22 cities. I gave 26 lectures over the course of like 35 days, 30, 35 days. And so every day, it was like me and my dog, we were just like driving 500 miles to the next city. I'd give a lecture, and I'd go out and have drinks with the people I met there. And then I'd 
crash somewhere and then go do it all over again. And That's so I just insane. drove around. Yeah, I just drove around America meeting my community and meeting all these people. And and one of the things that I really learned and I didn't know this before this tour was I have a huge following in Florida. Out of all places, Florida. Every time I spoke in Florida, there were like 50 to 100 people would come out to hear me talk. And yeah, and so I was like, yeah, it was so I, Florida was a lot of fun. The rest of the country was amazing. And um, I came back and now I've decided, I said, you know what, if I have such a huge audience in Florida, I gotta go down there. And so I'm hanging out in New York right now until about November. If today's date is, it's the middle of September now. I'm gonna hang out here until November. And then I'm actually gonna become a Florida resident for, for tax purposes. I'm gonna head down to Florida and, and start doing some more lectures and workshops and young architect stuff because there's no, I don't have to be in New York. I can essentially work anywhere. So. Sure. You may as well uh, follow the seasons or at least the weather that you enjoy. That's awesome. Yeah. That's super yeah. cool. All right. Now here's the portion where maybe we can contribute or you can contribute, Mike, some side hustle ideas maybe that you don't have time to pursue. So do you have any ideas that you know maybe it scratches your own itch, you wish someone was doing a service or something like that that you could take advantage of? I feel like I have a million, but they're not on the tip of my you know, like I just have them right now. However, I could talk about a couple of things that I've tried and haven't worked out for me. All right, that's good. One of my big projects that I put a lot of time, money, and energy into were the cycling blogs. And I've written all this content. And, you know, with SEO and social media and everything I learned from Young Architect, I was like, you know what? I'm going to build a completely separate empire around cycling. And I, and, and Doug, I, you know, I, th I think I told you in our emails, I read your book, The Niche Site Project, many years ago. And I think right. it may have inspired this. You may have inspired me from, you know, this bike blog project that I wanted to work on. And I started, I built this beautiful website. I said, I'm going to monetize this with Amazon links and social media systems and all this stuff. And then in the middle of my, 2016 bike trip, as I was kind of just getting started with this, this new source of income, I realized that I didn't really like my audience for the bike project. It was a lot of cranky old men who were constantly messaging me on social media and in my blogs saying, Mike, you're not doing it right. Why are you carrying a computer? And like giving me advice about how to cycle cross country. And I was like, you know what? This is my third cross country bike ride. I don't care what your opinion is. When I was writing all this content, I wrote 100,000 words on that 2016 bike ride, and I realized my social media went bananas, but no one was actually, the traffic was actually way down. And so I kind of had this moment where I realized that I didn't really like my community as much as I thought I did. Uh, the young architect community was always so much more gracious and didn't give me a hard time about anything. And so I ended up letting that go as time went on. There were also, you know, shortly after I read your book too, Doug, I wanted to create all these niche sites that I had all these ideas about Amazon associates and how to just drive more traffic into Amazon so I can make more and more money. You wrote an amazing book in, in you know, all respect Thanks. and I think everyone should read it and I learned a lot. But I realized it was taking me away from something that was already successful. And what I really needed to do was to channel my energy on Young Architect at that time and focus more on that. And so I ended up starting a bunch of projects that were great ideas about these just neat, they were niche site ideas. I'll tell you what they were after this conversation, if you want to know. <laughs> You're probably 10 steps ahead of them. I ended up letting it all go just so I could hone in and really dial in what was already working for me. And then another thing that happened too, you know, was at a certain point I was making like 1,500, 2,000 bucks a month with just Amazon Associates. And then they restructured their whole free, their whole fee okay. program. And it hit a lot of people really hard. I'm sure hit you pretty hard. Mm -hmm. And I went from making 2000 bucks a month to now making 500 bucks a month. And that's where it's been consistently. And gotcha. a lot of these Amazon, and you know, Amazon started, you know, monetizing the blog, but my passion around that, why am I gonna go out of my way to write all this content that's really kind of focused on Amazon? And so I, I really, it sucks that that happened, but it forced me to find other ways and to create other systems to make up for that loss of income when they restructured that fee program. Got it. And, and that for people that don't know, that was back in March of 2017. They just restructured the commission rates. And yeah. I, actually, that's one of the worst drops that I've heard of. I got hit big, but it wasn't as catastrophic as what you described. But I wanted to compliment you on your ability to like cut off projects that are not serving like your your main purpose it's really hard to do that with a retail arbitrage that's bringing in good money you have great ideas you have a strong interest in cycling and yet you realized hey that's not the people that i want to be working with so 
I mean, that's really hard to do. So good job on like focusing on, you know, your North star as they yeah. say. Thank you. People can find you at youngarchitect.com. Is there anywhere else that you want people to, to yeah. check it out? I'm all over social media. If you type in Young Architect into any of the social medias, I pretty much pop up. Um, right on, right on. And yeah. before we head out, do you have any you know, closing words, any advice to people who, you know, especially in your case, like maybe they want to do something like using the skills from their day job to parlay that into like something more meaningful, maybe work for themselves? Any advice? Yeah, absolutely. You can definitely do it. You can definitely do it. There's, you know, there's that famous Steve Jobs quote, you know, the, the talks about how he went to college, he dropped out of college, he studied, you know, typography, a little of this, a little of that. And it didn't make sense how what he was doing at the time. But when you look back and you see what he's accomplished, it all makes a lot of sense. And so and that's kind of my story as well is, you know, I, getting my license as an architect, all of these things I've created were not clear at the beginning. And a big thing a big I've always been a big proponent on just taking action do the work do the work even if it's sloppy it's never going to be perfect be content with putting stuff out there that's 85 percent and get it out there getting it out there is the most important thing because once you get you publish and you put things out there you get information back from your audience and it, and that's how opportunities pop up and that's how all of these pieces start to fall into place is by taking the action it's never clear at the beginning but it will the, the route will un, will reveal itself if you can just take consistent action and keep moving forward. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Mike, for joining us today. Everybody, be sure to check out uh, Mike's stuff over at youngarchitect.com. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me.